just want to remind you, given that this is not an audience that works on malaria, malaria continues to be a major global health problem. It's estimated that there are about 500 million cases of falciparum malaria each year, which lead to about 1 million deaths every year, primarily in small children. In addition to falciparum, there's also another parasite species, Plasmodium species, that causes significant human malaria, and that's Plasmodium vivax. And there are about 90 million cases of vivax malaria. And it has so far been thought, you know, because falciparum leads to death, uh, vivax is, was thought of as a more benign form of malaria. But as investigations more recently have shown, vivax can also lead to severe disease and could actually also contribute to significant deaths. Uh, this shows you the map of where malaria is a problem. And when I was looking at this and pre preparing to come here to ICGB Trieste, I, I realized there's a significant overlap between this map and the map of ICGB member states. Uh, and so I think it's, it's fitting that we have a malaria program at ICGB. Uh, Italy is not shaded in green, but if ICGB had started in the middle of last century, even Italy would be green because there was malaria here. And malaria was eradicated from Italy, Spain, parts of southern Europe only in the middle of last century. And in fact, a lot of the early research on malaria, a lot, lot of very important contributions came from Italian researchers and names such as Bignami, Bastianelli, and even Golgi, the well-known cell biologist, has made very important contributions to understanding the malaria parasite life cycle, which is shown here in this slide. The uh, infection in humans is initiated when a mosquito takes a blood meal and injects sporozoites, which first go to the liver, multiply in the liver, differentiate into merozoites, which are released into the bloodstream, which go on to invade red blood cells. And as they multiply, all the clinical symptoms of malaria are attributed to the blood stage of the parasite life cycle. There are no symptoms when the parasite is in the liver. In the blood stage, some of the parasites differentiate into male and female gametocytes are again taken up by a mosquito. They undergo developed fertilization and for development in the mosquito midgut develop into sporozoites which go back to the salivary glands and are ready to be injected. So that's it's a complex life cycle and these parasites given that they survive in two very different hosts in invertebrate hosts, the mosquito and humans, you know, it's very complex and very interesting biology. And if you, the idea is if you understand this biology, you might be able to make interventions to block the parasite life cycle. Now, all our work is focused on the blood stage of the parasite life cycle, and we are interested in understanding the process of red cell invasion. And the questions that I will talk about today are what are the key molecular interactions involved in binding of the merozoite to red cells leading to invasion, and what are some of the, it's a complex process, so what are some of the signaling mechanisms involved in this process? And I'll show how this work has led to a possible build, helped us build a rationale for a vaccine. So if you look at invasion, invasion has been studied both by video microscopy and also electron microscopy. And this shows you a malaria parasite trying to invade a red blood cell here. And the features I'd like to point out are, first of all, malaria parasites belong to the apicomplexin group, which means these are parasites which have membrane-bound organelles at the apical end, referred to as rub trees, these large organelles, and smaller organelles here, also here, called the micronemes. And these membrane-bound organelles contain proteins that play a critical role in invasion, as I will show you. So in the first step, the parasite attaches and then reorients, so with the apical end facing the red cell membrane. Then you can see a junction develop, this thickening of the red cell membrane at the point of contact. And then as the parasite moves in, this junction, which is seen here in, in this magnified image, this junction, as the parasite moves in, moves around the parasite. You see it's free at this end. The junction is now here. So if you think in three dimensions, the junction will be all around this merozoid and will move around the merozoid so that it's finally in a vacuole surrounded by a vacuolar membrane. So it's a complex process, possibly involving multiple receptor ligand interactions. And 
What we know, so based on such studies, we have a model where the parasite first interacts and this first interaction can take place on any part of the merozoite surface. The then reorients, then the, you see the uh, formation of this junction. A lot of proteins that are involved in invasion, as I mentioned, are in micronemes and drop trees. So at some point, they have to be secreted to the surface to make contact with their receptors on the red cell. And then as this parasite moves into this growing vacuole, the junction moves around the merozoite and is finally, uh, the merozoite is in a vacuole surrounded by a vacuolar membrane. So over the last 20 or so years, a number of parasite proteins and their genes have been identified, including proteins on the surface that are referred to as merozoite surface proteins. There are others in the micronemes, and there's a family that I will talk about, which is the erythrocyte binding antigens. It's a multi-copy family, so once this refers to the size, 175 kilodaltons, etc. There are other important proteins in the ROP trees, the RAP1s, the ROP, the RH proteins, and all these are thought, are, have been some, many of these have been shown to bind receptors on red cells. So now going back, in, how was, were all, you know, what are the receptors involved in invasion? So the first clues about the receptors came from studies that looked at the invasion specificity of different plasmodium species. And it was reported in the 70s uh, then this was work of Lou Miller at the NIH that vivax can only invade Duffy positive human red cells. That is red cells which have a, the Duffy blood group antigen on their surface. Duffy negative red cells which lack the Duffy antigen are completely resistant to infection with vivax. And which is why in sub-Saharan Africa where 95% of the people are Duffy negative, you don't have any vivax. Noel's eye is a simian malaria, infects rhesus monkeys, and we use it as a model. It can also infect human red cells, but again, it requires interaction with Duffy for invasion into human red cells. So it will invade Duffy positive, but not Duffy negative. It infects, infects rhesus monkey red cells. We don't have Duffy negative rhesus monkeys. But if you take rhesus red cells and treat them with chymotrypsin and remove the Duffy antigen, the chym Duffy antigen is chymotrypsin sensitive, Nolzai still invade, suggesting that some parasites like Nolzai must have multiple invasion pathways for invading into rhesus red cells. So there could be redundancy in invasion pathways. <laughs> now falciparum doesn't require Duffy. It's rampant all over Africa, so it couldn't require Duffy for invasion. Initial studies suggested they use silic acid residues on glycophorin molecules. So if you treat with neuraminidase, you lose invasion, but only for some parasites. Like Noel's eye, falciparum also appears to have redundancy in the receptors they can use. So these then are some of the receptors. Duffy antigen for vivax and Noel's eye for invasion into human red cells. Silic acids on glycophorins, but there could be other receptors for falciparum. Once these receptors were identified, the parasite proteins that bind these receptors were identified, and these are referred to as erythrocyte binding proteins. And then the genes for these were cloned. So one protein and the gene was identified from Vivax, and that's referred to as the Duffy binding protein because it binds the Duffy antigen. Three related genes were found from Noel's eye, alpha encoding the Duffy binding protein, and beta and gamma are homologs that bind other receptors. And similarly, falciparum, again, there was a family identified EBA-175 binds silic acid on glycophorin A, and these others bind other glycophorin. So you see the parasite has sort of diversified or multiplied this family to generate redundancy in the receptors they can use. But Vivax has only one, only is, is binding to Duffy antigen is essential for Vivax. And they, all these proteins have similar structures. They have a signal sequence, transmembrane domain to get it to the surface. Uh, and the extracellular domain, most interestingly, has these two cysteine-rich domains which are conserved the only difference is the falciparum has a duplication of these cysteine-rich domains. Now, we wanted to ask the question, what step in the invasion process are these proteins involved in? Uh, you can't culture Vivax, so we couldn't do the experiment with Vivax, but you can culture Noel's eye. So we culture Noel's eye. There are genetic methods to knock out genes in Noel's eye. So we, developed, so we created, we knocked out the alpha gene and created a knockout parasite that no longer has the Duffy binding protein, still has beta and gamma, so you can still culture it in rhesus red cells. 
And then we took these knockout parasites, so alpha knockout parasites that don't have the Duffy antigen, Duffy binding protein anymore, and asked the question, can these still infect recess red blood cells? And they can. And if you look by electron microscopy, you can see this is the merozoid, this is the recess red cell. You get a close interaction. Uh, there is some signs of a junction, and you get invasion. But if you take these knockout parasites, remember, doesn't have Duffy binding protein, which is the only, which interacts with Duffy antigen, and that's the only pathway for invasion into human red cells. If you allow it to interact with Duffy positive human red cells, you get apical reorientation. Here's the nucleus at the posterior end. Here are the apical organelles. Here's one. So you've got apical reorientation, but the interaction is not as close, and a junction does not develop, and invasion is aborted at this step. So what this tells you is that the interaction of these erythrocyte binding proteins with their receptors, Duffy binding protein with Duffy antigen, mediates this step of junction formation, and this is critical for invasion. Now the next question is, where is this Duffy binding protein in the parasite? Well, it turns out it's not on the surface, but it's in these apical organelles, the micronemes. This is an immunoelectron micrograph using antibodies to the Duffy binding protein. So the next question is, how is this secreted to come to the surface to allow it to interact with the receptor? At what stage is it secreted? And similarly, there are other important proteins in the ROP trees. So the question is, when are ROP trees secreted? Are micronemes and ROP trees secreted together? What are the signals that trigger their secretion? And these are some of the questions we have started working on over the past few years. Now, taking an analogy from other cells, for example, in neurons, it's known that vesicles containing neurotransmitters can be triggered to be released to the surface in response to calcium signals. And the same thing is true in parasites. It's been shown in Toxoplasma gondii, another AP complex in parasites, which also has micronemes. And in Toxoplasma, what they could do is if you triggered a calcium spike intracellularly by adding, say, a calcium ionophore, you could trigger release of microneme proteins to the surface. And we wondered if the same kind of thing might happen in malaria parasites. And so the first thing we wanted to do to see if calcium could be a potential signal, we thought, what are the levels of calcium in free merozoites during the process of invasion? And to test that, we decided to do an experiment using a calcium-sensitive fluorescent dye, fluor 4 am So we took parasites. This, this is now done with falciparum. So we took falciparum cultures, labeled the parasites with fluor 4 am So this is a late-stage schizont, has multiple merozoites in it. It's, it's fluorescing green. And then we allowed it to rupture naturally. And we followed invasion of red cells. So I'm going to run a movie. And what you will see is the schizont will rupture. Small, tiny merozoites will come out. And one of them will come and invade this red cell here. So oops. So there, you get rupture, and you notice that the merozoites are green, suggesting calcium levels are high. Here is one. It's bound. It flips that merozoite over and finally invades. And when it invades, the merozoite sort of loses its biconcave shape. And if it movie went a little longer, it would then restore back the biconcave shape, and the parasite would then start multiplying. So it's a very rapid process. But the important thing is the free merozoites have high levels of calcium. And if you actually follow an individual merozoite, if you look at a merozoite that just swims around and doesn't invade, that's the black, or black boxes, the calcium levels continue to remain high. But if you actually look frame by frame and look at an in, a merozoite that invades, <laughs> then the merozoite calcium levels are high. And then once it attaches to a red blood cell, actually the calcium levels drop, and then you get invasion. So just remember this. So calcium levels are high in merozoites when they're swimming around in media. And then after attachment, calcium levels drop, and then you get invasion. So given that calcium levels are high, it could potentially be a signal for micronema or ROP tree release. Next, we have to develop methods to actually isolate merozoites. These methods were not available. And the way we do that is we synchronize cultures of falciparum very tightly. And then when you have really late state schizont, so here's a schizont with lots of tiny merozoites in it. You can see this is the hemozoin pigment, which is the polymerized heme after the parasite has used the hemoglobin for growth. 
and then you allow these to rupture naturally and then just by differential centrifugation you can collect the merozoites and use them for your experiments. So we could label them with for example flow of 4am, the dye we could show distributes nicely in the cytoplasm and then you could use either microscopy or even flow cytometry to look at calcium levels in these merozoites. So if you take merozoites in media in RPMI and then now if you add a calcium ionophore A23187 you can trigger release of calcium from intracellular stores and see an increase in intracellular calcium. And if you do this in the presence of BAPTA AM, you can block that increase. So we now have methods to look at calcium levels in merozoites and trigger levels of free calcium in these merozoites. Now if you do this, the question is, do you get release of microneme proteins to the surface? And to do that, we developed another assay, again using flow cytometry, using antibodies to EBA175, a microneme protein. So these are merozoites, so let me walk you through this, uh, this graph. So this is, we are now looking at the, uh, with these antibodies to see EBA175 on the surface of merozoites. If you use pre-immune sera, that's the black curve. Merozoites in RPMI, the red curve. And now if you add A23187, you can see a shift to the right, which means there's almost a tenfold increase of EBA175 on the surface if you trigger a calcium spike using A23187. And you can block that increase if you do that in the presence of BAPTA So that suggests that triggering a calcium spike leads to release of microneme proteins to the surface. If you do the same experiment in the presence of saponin, so that you're now looking at EBA175 both on the surface and intracellularly, there is no change. Suggesting that it's not that with the calcium spike, the parasite produced more EBA175, it's just translocating from an intracellular to an extracellular location. So micro, uh, rise in intracellular calcium levels triggers microneme release, and we have tested this for other microneme proteins. We have looked at the same thing by immunofluorescence assay. You can see this parasite in RPMI add A23187, lot more EBA175 at the apical end, and with BAPTIM, no release. So we have sort of confirmed what we see with facts using uh, IFA. Now what about ROP3 proteins? So CLAC 3.1 is a ROP3 protein. It's another adhesive protein involved in invasion. And here we've looked at using antibodies to CLAC 3.1. Red curve is RPMI. You trigger calcium spike. No change in levels of ROP3 protein on the surface. And we have looked at MSP4, which is merozoite surface protein 4, which is constitutively expressed on the surface. Again, no change. So triggering a calcium spike specifically triggers release of microneme proteins to the surface, not ROP3 proteins, and also doesn't affect constitutive pathways. Now, here we have artificially triggered a calcium spike. What's going on during invasion? What is the natural signal during invasion that will lead to a calcium spike and release of microneme proteins? Well, thinking about what might be a potential signal, one thing we realized is one thing that's very different when the merozoite is inside and multiplying within a red cell and outside is the ionic concentrations. Inside a red cell, as in any cell, you have low sodium, high potassium, very little calcium. Whereas in plasma, in vivo or in media, you have the reverse. You have high sodium, low potassium, and millimolar calcium. And so we wondered, when the merozoite comes out, does it in some way sense the ionic environment? And does that lead to a calcium spike triggering microneme release? And so we tested that. So we now took merozoites in intracellular-like buffer. So we suspended merozoites in sodium chloride, uh, low uh, NAC, uh, low sodium, high potassium, and no calcium, and then just change the buffer to the reverse, high sodium, low potassium, and some calcium, and ask the question, does this lead to an intracellular increase in calcium? And here is the data. So if you take merozoites in IC and then switch them to EC, you can see an increase in intracellular calcium. So it appears that it's the ionic environment that might be the signal to lead to a rise in intracellular calcium. And does this lead to release of microneme proteins? And so again, we are here, we are looking at EBA175. Red curve is merozoites in IC. You just change the buffer to EC, and you get an increase in EBA175 on the surface. And you block that if you do it in the presence of baptite and chelate the calcium. 
So it seems to be the ionic environment is what triggers calcium spike and microneme release. But the next question is, which of these three ions is really the signal? Is it sodium or potassium or extracellular calcium? Well, it turns out what the parasite is sensing is just potassium. So if you switch from this IC to ICK low, where sodium remains the same, we are only changing potassium from high to low. There is no calcium here and no extracellular calcium. Just changing the potassium ion concentration from high to low leads to an increase in intracellular calcium and also leads to microneme release. So here, red curve is again IC, blue is EC, and pink is ICK low, and it's overlapping. So just the change in the potassium ion concentration leads to a calcium spike and microneme release. And you don't need extracellular calcium. So that means the calcium is coming from intracellular stores. Now, how does this calcium come out from intracellular stores? It's usually stored in the ER. Well, in, from other systems, we know that there are IP3 receptors and signals, extracellular signals are transduced to activate phospholipase C, which produces diacylglycerol and IP3, which then binds to the IP3 receptor, leading to release of calcium from the ER. And we wondered if the same thing was going on in malaria parasites. So we tested an inhibitor of phospholipase C, U73122, and first looked at levels of calcium. So we are now going, if you go from IC to EC, increase in calcium. If you do that in the presence of U73122, the green curve, you block that increase. And if you do that in the presence of an inactive analog of U73122, that's U73343, you get an increase. So it seems to be, it's through a phospholipase C pathway that the parasite is releasing calcium from intracellular stores. And you can block also microneme secretion. So red curve is IC, blue is EC. You do it in the presence of U73122, you block release of microneme proteins. So that seems to be the story for microneems. Now what about ROP trees? Remember when we triggered calcium release, there was no change in ROP tree proteins. So what is the signal for release of ROP tree proteins during invasion? Well, what we wondered was, maybe this is a two-step process. When the parasite comes out, it senses change in ionic environment, microneme proteins such as EBA-175, erythrocyte binding antigens are released to the surface, and maybe once they bind to their receptors on the red cell, when EBA-175 binds glycophorin A, maybe that's the second signal that triggers release of ROP tree proteins. And so we tested that idea. So what we did now is we took merozoites. If you switch from IC to EC, we should get a calcium spike. But we, 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 uh, we predict that we may not get ROP tree release, but we'll get EBA-175 release. And maybe if you add glycophorin A now, you allow it to bind its receptor, maybe that's what will trigger ROP tree release, such as release of CLAC 3.1, a ROP, ROP tree marker. And so here's the data. So here again, we are now looking at CLAC 3.1 on the merozoite surface. Black is premium sera, red is IC, so some CLAC 3.1. Now if you switch from IC to EC, which is the blue curve, no change in CLAC 3.1, as we had predicted. But now if you add glycophorin A, when you go from IC to EC, EBA-175 is now on the surface. You add its receptor, and maybe that engagement triggers release of CLAC 3.1. So that seems to be the signal for release of ROP tree proteins. Now, I haven't really shown you that I've just added glycophorin A and got ROP tree release. I haven't really shown you that it's binding of EBA-175 to glycophorin A that's really doing this. And to do that, what I need to do is use a knockout parasite. So there are parasites where EBA-175 has been genetically deleted. And so now, if I do this experiment, I shouldn't, glycophorin A shouldn't do anything because it doesn't have its ligand. But remember, EBA-175 has other members of the family, EBA-140, EBA-181, which bind other glycophorins, glycophorin B, C, uh, and others. So now here, again, we are looking at CLAC 3.1 on the surface. Red curve is intracellular conditions. Blue is EC, no change. Now I add glycophorin A to these knockout parasites, no change, because it doesn't have EBA-175. 
Now I can't buy glycophorin B or C, sigma doesn't sell it, but I can add red blood cell ghosts which have the other receptors. And if I do that, then I trigger release of ruptured proteins. So that seems to be holding out. That, so the scenario is merozoites come out, sense low potassium in the environment, leads to a calcium spike, EBA 175 and the other EBA homologs come to the surface. When the metazoite binds to their receptors through EBA 175 glycophorin A or the other EBAs, that triggers rupture release and that is the second step for interactions uh, for invasion. Now what's happening to calcium? Now remember during invasion, I said calcium levels were high when the metazoite bound the red cell, calcium levels dropped and then you got invasion. So let's look at what's happening to calcium levels as we switch merozoites through different conditions. So as we take merozoites from IC and switch them to EC, calcium levels go high, as we have seen before. And now if I add glycophorin A, the receptor for EBA175, look at what's happening to calcium. Calcium goes back down. So it's restored back to basal levels before invasion takes place. So then the model we have for invasion is the merozoites, when they are in a low potassium environment, when they come out into plasma, that through some mechanism, and we still don't understand this, seems to activate phospholipase C, which produces IP3, which then binds to IP3 receptors on ER, releases calcium, and this triggers microneme release. We still don't know what the mechanisms are, how calcium leads to microneme release, but that's the first step. And then following this, once EBA175 from the microneme and other EBAs are on the surface, when they bind their receptors on the red cell, that again through a mechanism we don't understand, restores calcium back to basal levels and triggers release of ROP3 proteins. And all these interactions are required for invasion to proceed. So this has really opened up many new, a new area of work for the lab. So we are now trying to understand how the potassium signal is transduced, how uh, you know, this increase in calcium leads to microneme release, and also what are the pathways for triggering rupture release. And if you understand these pathways, if there are some unique things in these pathways, those could potentially become drug targets because if you block microneme rupture release, <coughs> you will not get invasion and you will block uh, growth of the parasite. So going back then to our erythrocyte binding protein, so what I've showed you is interaction of these proteins is critically required for the step of junction formation for invasion. And these proteins are intracellularly localized, but when the merozoites are free, they are secreted to come to the surface. And given that they mediate such an important step in the invasion pathway, these could be potential vaccine candidates. The idea is if you raise antibodies to these, if you block their interaction with the red cells, you might be able to block invasion. However, to do that, the first thing you need to do is map where in these proteins the binding domain lies because these are all very large proteins, all 150, 170 kilodaltons in size. And so we produced different parts of these proteins and tested them for binding to red cells. And interestingly, we found that in each case, it was this N-terminal cysteine-rich region that was the binding domain. So region two of the YVAX Duffy binding protein, we could show specifically binds the human Duffy antigen. Region two of DBP, uh, the Knowles I alpha, binds rhesus and human Duffy antigens. Beta and gamma region two bind rhesus receptors, not, don't bind human red cells. And in case of the EBAs, region two of EBA175 binds silic acid on glycophorin A. Uh, and here, of course, there's a duplication. That's the only difference. So these domains are individual domains at about 40 kilodaltons in size. They are multiple cysteines which are conserved in position. So they define a particular motif of cysteine uh, uh, residues. And these are then what a lot of our work has focused on in terms of understanding how they interact with their receptors and whether antibodies to these will block invasion. And the first experiment we did was again we went to the Knowles eye system. We are developing a vaccine based on EBA175 actually in combination with another protein called merozoite surface protein one that Dr. Chohan 
uh, works on and that vaccine is already in a clinical trial which just was started last year but I'm going to talk about our work on the Vivax Duffy binding protein today. So again we went to the homologous Knowles eye system produce Knowles eye alpha region 2 that's the Duffy binding protein of Knowles eye region 2 raised antibodies and tested whether these could block invasion in vitro and you can see that antibodies to region 2 of the Duffy binding protein block invasion of Knowles eye into both human as well as rhesus red blood cells. So that sort of proves that the concept of, of this vaccine at least in vitro that antibodies to this receptor binding domain could block invasion. But there's a lot more you need, to for, you need to understand. One of the problems in developing vaccines for parasites is the problem of polymorphisms and sequence variation. So how much sequence variation is there in this domain? If you make a vaccine with one domain, will they really work? Will that vaccine work against all the parasite strains that are there? And to understand this question, you know, people have sequenced this domain, the receptor binding domain of Duffy binding protein from Vivax isolates around the world, and you actually see a lot of polymorphisms. So a criticism we often received was, how is your vaccine going to work, given the amount of polymorphisms there are in this domain? And to really answer the question, you really need to do a lot of detailed structure function studies. We felt the key question was, are there polymorphisms in the binding site? or are the polymorphisms away from the binding site? And so to address that question, one of the first things we did was in collaboration with Amit Sharma, a crystallographer at ICGB in New Delhi, they solved the structure of this region two, the receptor binding domain of the Duffy binding protein. And to just walk you through the structure, there are three subdomains. Here's the end terminus. There is a random coil, and this is held together by two disulfide linkages. Then there is a region that seems to be flexible because we don't have a structure which goes into this alpha helix, alpha 1. There are six alpha helices in this second domain that is held together by one disulfide linkages. And then through this linker, you go into this third subdomain, which again has six alpha helices held together by three disulfide linkages. And so all the disulfide linkages are intra-domain, and these three domains are held together by hydrophobic interactions between these domains. So that's what this structure looks like. Now the question is, where in this, do, where in this, re, in this binding domain is the binding site? And to address that question, we needed to develop a quantitative binding assay. We had shown previously that the Vivax region 2 and also the Knowles I alpha region 2 binds the Duffy antigen, which is also a receptor for chemokines, that's why it's referred to as Duffy antigen receptor for chemokines or DARK. It binds the N-terminal 66 amino acids that are extracellular. So we produce this N-terminal 66 amino acids as a fusion to human FC, produced it as a secreted protein in mammalian cells, purified it, and developed this assay. We coat this N-terminal of the Duffy antigen fused to human FC on ELISA well plates. We can then add recombinant Vivax region 2, the binding domain, and detect the binding using antibodies in a sort of ELISA format. Now notice there are two tyrosines in this N-terminal of the Duffy antigen, and these are sulfated. And what I'll show you is that sulfation of tyrosine 41 is actually critical for this interaction. So here is the data. So here, as you increase the amount of PVR2, you get a nice saturation curve. And if you mutate tyrosine 41 to phenylalanine, which cannot be sulfated, you completely lose binding. Another control is the chemokine receptor from T cells. If you take the similar N-terminal region, again, there is no binding. So it's very specific binding to the Duffy antigen. And a critical element of the interaction with the Duffy antigen is the sulfated tyrosine at position 41. Now, again, using this quantitative binding assay, we did deletion studies, also site-directed mutagenesis, and I'm just going to show you the final data. These red stars indicate the residues. The top line is the Vivax region 2, indicate the residues where mutation to alanine led to complete loss of binding, so more than 80% redu reduction in binding. And what you can see is there are two kinds of residues. There are Hydrophobic residues like this tyrosine, uh, phenylalanine, 
tyrosine, leucine, phenylalanine, isoleucine, and some positively charged residues like this arginine, uh, another lysine. So there's a mix of positively charged residues and hydrophobic residues around cysteine 5 and cysteine 6. Now the question is, how do these residues come together to form a binding site? Well, now that we have the structure, you can actually map them on the surface of the Duffy binding protein, the, the receptor binding domain. This is a false color, so there are the three subdomains. This first subdomain is green, the second subdomain is colored yellow, and the third is colored blue. And so the entire binding site, or at least this critical part of the binding site that we have identified, lies in subdomain 2. And you can see all the hydrophobic residues line up, they're coded red, and the positively charged residues are coded blue, and they come together. So the binding site is on the surface, fully exposed, and has dual character. It has hydrophobic residues and positively charged residues. And you can actually dock its sulfated tyrosine very nicely into this binding site with the negatively charged sulfate interacting with the positively charged residues and the hydrophobic ring of the tyrosine interacting with the hydrophobic residues. And we are working with Amit now to try and get a co-crystal. But going back to our studies on questions related to vaccine development, you can now ask the question, where are the polymorphisms in this receptor binding domain? Well, it turns out the binding site is highly conserved. And in fact, the two regions that are highly polymorphic are shaded here in, in, in gray, and they are quite distal from the binding site. And to actually take a good look at them, you have to turn this molecule around, and here are the polymorphic regions. And now the binding site is on the far side of the screen. And so what this tells you is that you know, what leads to the rise in these polymorphisms? It's basically immune responses in the field. When people are infected, they generate immune responses. And to get away from the immune responses, the parasite changes its, the sequences in its proteins. Now, what this suggests is that upon natural exposure, what your immune system sees is probably this protein already bound to its receptor. So you probably make antibodies to this opposite surface, and because this is not functionally you know, important, the parasite can make changes in the sequence leading to these polymorphisms in this opposite surface. Now, based on this structure function study, you can make some predictions of what you might find in the field. If you go to a place with lots of malaria, where people are getting repeatedly infected, what you would predict is, in the field, naturally acquired high titer anti-PVR2 blocking antibodies, that is antibodies against the binding site that will block the interaction, are likely to be rare. Because if they were common, you would see more polymorphisms near the binding site. Also, once you make those blocking antibodies, those should be strain transcending, because there's no polymorphism in the binding site. And the question that's most important is, does the presence of such blocking antibodies protect individuals against Vivax infection? Now what happens in the field is it's mainly the children who get repeatedly infected and they eventually build up immunity. You never get sterilizing immunity, but you get immunity that reduces the number of times you get infected and helps you to keep parasitemia down so that you don't get sick. And so we did a study in Papua New Guinea. This is Papua New Guinea, northern coast of Australia in children in this village of Mugil on the northern coast where children are repeatedly infected both with Vivax and falciparum. And this is the study design. So in the first week of the study, 200 children were enrolled. The children were treated with artesunate to clear blood stage infections. And then every two weeks, the children reported to the clinic, finger prick blood was taken, and we observed whether they have infections or Vivax or falciparum and what the parasite densities were. And at time zero, we also collected sera and tested them in binding assays to see in our functional binding assay whether they have receptor blocking uh, function. And so when we tested the sera in our receptor uh, binding inhibition assay, we found only 18 children out of 200 had high titer blocking antibodies. And we defined that as greater than 90% inhibition at a dilution of 1 is to 5. So that's only 9%. Another 20%, 40 out of 200, had intermediate blocking antibodies. 
but the vast majority had low or no blocking antibodies. So this is something we had predicted. Blocking antibodies would be rare. And if you look by other criteria, age, percent female, total number of observations in the different groups, there are no differences indicating that we are not biased in any way in making, stratifying the population into these three groups. Now the question you can ask is, does the presence of blocking antibodies reduce your risk of infection? And one way to look at that is by plotting Kaplan-Meier curves. So the red curve is for the high blockers and the black curve is for the low blockers. So the first time a kid, a child from the high blockers gets sick is much later than the child from the low blockers. And also by the end of the study, there are fewer children, proportion uninfected is higher for the high blockers compared to the low blockers. Now remember, you never get sterilizing immunity against malaria parasite. So if you go far enough, all the children will get infected. But this separation of curves suggests that there is a protective effect if you have high blocking antibodies. And how, how do you read the, what is the reading now? Uh, basically on a slide. So you get finger prick blood every two weeks and you look to see if there are parasites. So if there are parasites, then you're infected. So if you do the statistics, this leads to a hazard ratio of 0.45, which means if you have high blocking antibodies, you have a 55% reduced risk of infection during this period. And if you look at falciparum, there is no protective effect, as you would expect, because Duffy binding protein is not involved. So this is a nice control that we are seeing a specific effect here. Now, even when you get infected, does the presence of high blocking antibodies help the children to reduce parasite densities? And that's shown here. So the black curve is the high blockers. They have a lower geometric mean parasitemia than the intermediate or low blockers. So even when you're infected, if you have high blocking antibodies, you can keep your parasitemia down. And no effect against falciparum. Again, a nice control. So having the high blocking antibodies protects you against Vivax infection. Now the other prediction we made is that if you make high blocking antibodies, these antibodies should be strain transcending. And so we have tested the binding inhibition of the high blockers against six variants of Vivax region 2. And this accounts for about 90% of the polymorphism seen in Papua New Guinea. And you can see that they block all of them equally well. So again, our prediction based on our structure function studies were that the polymorphisms will not be important. That once you make blocking antibodies, they will be strain transcending. So what I've shown you then is that the interaction of Duffy binding protein with Duffy antigen is essential for invasion. Antibodies can block red blood cell invasion in vitro. I've shown it with the Knowles eye model. Naturally acquired antibodies that block this interaction protect against Vivax infection in the field. And such blocking antibodies are strain transcending. So polymorphisms should not be a problem for a vaccine based on this. So this has encouraged us to sort of carry forward and actually develop a vaccine. So we, this is our pilot facility to produce recombinant proteins. We have developed methods to produce it in E. coli, which has required developing methods to refold the protein and purify it in its correct conformation. This shows you the kind of quality of protein we produce. And we have used this for immunogenicity studies in small animals to identify adjuvants we can take to the clinic. These are very uh, novel new adjuvants, glycolipid A, R848, which is a TLR78 agonist, and this shows you, shows you one immunogenicity study where we immunize three weeks apart and collect sera and finally test in, uh, by ELISA. We get very good antibodies with GLAOF, as good as Freund's adjuvant, which is our reference sera. And then when we test them for binding inhibition, here this is refers to as inhibition power, which means we have divided by the ELISA titer to look at really the quality of blocking. It's not just that we have large amount of antibodies. And again, GLAOF comes out pretty well. And we have then tested these antibodies for inhibiting the different variants to make sure we are getting strain transcending antibodies. And you can see that they block all of them equally well. So we have now a method to produce this antigen. We have identified an adjuvant to take to the clinic. And we are in the process of actually transferring this to a, a contract manufacturing organization to produce this uh, vaccine under GMP so that we can take it to the clinic. So then to conclude, what I've shown you is that 
the key molecules involved in invasion in making receptor ligand interactions are in microneems and drop trees. I haven't really told you much about drop tree proteins, but there are a number we are following up which could in, in the future be combined with microneem proteins to make a cocktail vaccine. But they are in internal organelles and the question is how are they released to the surface and I have shown you some new data on the sequence of release and all the signaling that is involved in their release. I have also shown you in some detail we have worked out the structure function studies on the interaction of the Duffy binding protein with the Duffy antigen and shown that the Duffy antigen recognition site is conserved. Also shown you from field studies that naturally acquired antibodies that block this interaction are associated with reduced risk of infection and lower parasite density suggesting that they are protective and immunization with recombinant PBR2 blocks binding and leads to strain transcending inhibitory antibodies which is uh, in favor of a vaccine based on this molecule. And these are the people in the lab who have done the work. Shalja and Alam did all the signaling work. Rushdi, Rukmini and Shams did all the vaccine development work. We have very good collaboration with Amit Sharma whose group solved the structure of the binding domain. We worked with Evo Muller and Chris King for the study in Papua New Guinea. Uh, we worked with the IDRI in Seattle. They gave us the adjuvants and these are some of the agencies that have supported our work in the lab. Thank you very much.